The success of the Navy SEAL's mission depends on training and stealth. Their goal, to evade communist-backed revolutionaries in Granada and rescue our allies. But when their covert operation is discovered, they're ambushed by rebel soldiers. Running out of ammo and out of time, they have to make every shot count to survive. In 1961, an elite team of special forces was created for covert operations on the sea, air, and land. Their missions have been kept secret for national security reasons. Who they are, what they do, has remained shrouded in secrecy. Now, based on first-hand accounts of classified operations, these are the untold stories of the Navy SEALs. October, 1983, Grenada. The Caribbean island was in chaos. A military coup had overthrown the government and taken over the island. Bring those prisoners out. Prime Minister Maurice Bishop, beloved by his countrymen and a friend of the U.S., had been ousted and thrown into prison. Over 9,000 supporters tried to rescue him. His life hung in the balance. Leading the coup was General Hudson Austin, a ruthless protege of Fidel Castro. He had been Bishop's comrade and friend until the Prime Minister moved to strengthen ties with the U.S. Austin took control of the island's military and pronounced himself leader of the PRA, the Provisional Revolutionary Army. When Bishop stood up for freedom, Austin unleashed his fury. Fight! With Bishop and his cabinet dead, only the voices of freedom crying from the streets remained. Austin quickly silenced them as well. The American government was concerned that the island could quickly become another Cuba, oppressing its people and serving as a potential staging ground for aggression. The U.S. presence on the island was limited. It didn't even have an embassy. There was a U.S. medical school on the island where several hundred American students were studying. Lisa Grimes and Karen Guthrie had come here in pursuit of their dream of becoming doctors. Living in Grenada had its drawbacks. Public utilities were often shut down and even the radio station would go off the air for unknown reasons. But the problem they encountered this day was not just another technological glitch. I can't believe the radio station's off the air again. Their tropical paradise was about to become a nightmare. They've sent out armored personnel carriers in the city. Their soldiers are killing people. Sam Paget, a fellow student, had just come from the street where the insurrection was mounting. Attention, all citizens of Grenada. Effective immediately, the Provisional Revolutionary Army has ordered a 24-hour curfew on the island. Any violator leaving the home will be shot on sight. We've got to get out of here. But the students quickly realized leaving wasn't an option. General Austin directed his PRA troops to surround the medical school. He knew there would be an international response to the coup, and the young Americans could be used as a bargaining chip. Karen, Lisa, and Sam were now pawns in a dictator's quest for power. A thousand miles away from the conflict, the Joint Special Operations Command, JSOC, in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, was enjoying its anniversary ball. 
Admiral Larry Walker led the evening's festivities. So better be good, Ensign. This is Walker. Then the word came from the Pentagon. A veteran of countless engagements in Vietnam, 50-year-old Admiral Walker, a longtime Navy SEAL, was now commander of JSOC. For all the times he had been called on short notice, he never got used to it. President Reagan ordered U.S. troops to the Caribbean without delay. Walker quickly summoned his most trusted field officer, Lieutenant Commander Mike Dillon. Walker had personally trained Commander Dillon. Yes, sir. Meet me in the briefing room with the rest of the staff in five minutes. Yes, sir. Their crisp military tone concealed the warm bond between the two men. Dylan and his wife Sandy were in high spirits on this festive night. I have to go. Until he got his new orders from Walker. He could not tell her where he was going or when he'd be back. Granada was part of the Commonwealth of the United Kingdom. The Queen's representative and longtime friend of the United States was Governor General Sir Paul Schoon. Though Austin had been threatening action for some time, Schoon and his family quickly realized things had taken a turn for the worse. What is going to happen to us? I don't know, dear. I don't think they're going to rush in and shoot us just yet. Schoon had secretly sent word through the Barbados ambassador asking the U.S. to intervene. The U.S. was better situated geographically to help, but he had no way of knowing if his message had gotten through. The coup leaders knew he had powerful connections around the world, and they watched him closely. One wrong move on his part might set off the volatile Austin and his PRA troops. Captain Derek Williamson was en route to Lebanon, carrying a thousand plus Marines to relieve the American peacekeeping force in Beirut. Sir, I have flash traffic from Atlantic Fleet. Thank you, Seaman. His mission was about to change. Navigator? Yes, sir. Plot me a new course for Grenada. Yes, sir. The independents and Guam battle groups were being called to Grenada. Williamson had been in the Navy for 23 years and had been on numerous tours around the globe. It's more important than weapon. Get me intel now. Carrier groups are how the U.S. exerts its political and military will around the globe. A change in mission reflected a change in world conditions. Captain Williamson immediately set about charting a new course. 180. 180, aye. 180, all ahead standard, aye. For the JSOC commanders, their evening of celebration had ended in a war room. They had to quickly evaluate their options and devise a strategy for engagement. General Austin's coup d'etat was not the only threat to Granada. Intelligence had been monitoring the construction of a large Cuban-built airport. The estimated 250 Cubans building the airport were believed to be trained soldiers. The CIA had also spotted Soviets, East Germans, North Koreans, and Libyans at the new airport. I saw these same photographs six months ago. What has Intel gathered since then? We're working on it. The U.S. had been monitoring the situation at a distance. Until Governor Schoon's request for help reached the White House. The U.S. took Austin's coup seriously. His communist-supported insurrection was a threat to freedom on the island. Indeed, the entire region. The time for a simple intervention had passed. 
President Reagan ordered U.S. troops to restore order by all means necessary. And the Navy SEALs would lead the invasion. There was no easy way in. It was an island over 100 miles from the nearest mainland. The first strike force would be one of Admiral Walker's SEAL teams. They'd have to parachute in off the coast of Granada. They were to sneak onto a small airfield and plant radio beacons along the runways to guide in the planes carrying the Army Rangers. It was supposed to be a daylight drop into calm seas. What's going on here? It's pitch black out there. Sorry, Lieutenant. Flight time was shorter than expected. Do you want to abort? Walker had trained his men to take decisive action, even when life and death hung in the balance. No, I don't want to abort. Ten minutes to exit. If there's a possibility that a mission can be accomplished, a SEAL will take that chance. The SEALs would parachute into the sea and climb into boats that had been dropped seconds ahead of them. It was a difficult plan in daylight, nearly impossible at night. No! Intel had predicted calm seas, but a major storm system unexpectedly developed. High winds had churned up 12-foot swells. The SEALs never made it to their boats. They fought to cut free from their chutes before being dragged underwater. Captain Williamson's battle group immediately began search and rescue operations. Half of the team was eventually pulled aboard Navy ships. But four SEALs were still missing at sea. They were racing against the clock. Though the tropical waters were warm, surviving in 12-foot waves while wearing full battle gear was nearly impossible. I know we're all concerned, but no one knows better than you the capabilities they have for surviving out in the open sea. Attention on deck! Though That's Dylan admonished the men to focus, he knew their concern would linger. I you all Fear be could not be their enemy. The for Commander Dylan and Admiral Walker, it was now time to move ahead. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening, sir. Good evening, sir. I'm here to brief you on your Grenada mission. Can we have the first slide, please. The Pentagon's overall invasion plan included both special and conventional forces. While Marines stormed the northern half of the island to free the medical school, the Army Rangers would seize the new runway in the south. The Air Force would provide close air support for all the invasion forces. And the SEALs would airlift Governor Schoon off the island. Their orders were simple. They had land two helicopters at the government house, his official residence, then speed him and his family to a Navy ship just offshore. Quick and clean. Intelligence was difficult to obtain. Other than high altitude surveillance, they had no way of determining Austin's troop movements. They estimated that Austin would concentrate his soldiers at the airfield. They didn't expect Schoon's residence to be heavily guarded. tolerated Schoon thus far. Schoon did not perceive himself as a military threat and hoped Austin would leave him and his family alone. But Austin and his PRA troops had other plans. Through a spy in the Barbados Embassy, 
Austin had learned that the Americans were coming, and he blamed the governor general. He ordered his men to lie in wait for the American assault. Dillon and his men were flying into an ambush. The SEALs had to find the Governor General's residence before they were spotted by Grenadian ground forces below. But that wasn't going to be easy. In 1983, satellite global positioning did not yet exist. Without troops on the ground, there was no way of pinpointing specific landing sites. The SEALs had to resort to using area land maps and visual references. Any sign yet? Not yet. Keep looking. When we come around, check the seaward side of this bridge again. Petty Officer Trevor Hill was the senior ranking enlisted man and Dillon's second in command. He was highly trained in visual surveillance and was using night vision goggles to ascertain their position. Radio chopper two, tell the men to look for government house. We're late. We need all the eyes we got looking. Yes, sir. Bring us around again. Medical students anxiously waited, held in their dorms under 24-hour curfew. Okay, Lisa, overwrought with fear, had somehow managed to fall asleep. Sam and Karen's fears would not be so easily suppressed. They tried to comfort themselves, thinking it would be over soon. But there was constant reminder just how serious the situation had become. Though they could only see a few soldiers outside their dormitory, they heard from other students that a larger troop presence was just beyond the campus. The U.S. forces were about to land. The invasion was on. I see it! You sure? Yes, sir! What they didn't see were the PRA soldiers maneuvering into position on the front lawn of the estate. Tell them that it's Shepard 2! Radio that position! We're going in! Tell them to follow us in! <coughs> yes, sir! Shepard 1, we're moving in! House on the right, 2 o'clock, that's our LZ! <laughs> The helicopter was an easy target for the PRA troops on the ground. Pummeled by intense enemy fire, the helicopter struggled to stay in the air. Get that fire off our backs now! Dillon's SEAL team was caught in the most dangerous position, hovering over the landing zone at Government House under intense enemy fire. They couldn't turn back, and they couldn't land. Their options were running out. The SEAL radio operator was hit ground radio destroyed. They had lost all communications with the Independents and JSOC. We lost the co-pilot! He's down! He's down! You all right? Help Helicopter troops! The fire's too heavy! A force delivery! Dillon ordered the second chopper to abort the mission. It too was under heavy attack. He knew he was losing half his fighting force and the only working long range radio. But if he didn't leave now, it might not make it back to the ship. 
Dylan's chopper couldn't stay in the air much longer. He had only a few seconds to decide whether to abort or attempt a landing. Just get us over the front lawn! We're gonna fast from down! 30 seconds! 30 seconds! 30, 30 seconds! seconds. We're, going We're going down! down. Yes, sir. only strengthened Dylan's resolve. He had only one option if he hoped to rescue the Governor General and his family. It was dangerous, but they'd have to fast rope into the machine gun fire below. The PRA troops quickly repositioned themselves and continued firing. on the ground, they covered their teammates and fought to establish an entry point. Go, 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 go! Just as the last seal landed, the engine took a direct hit. The crippled helicopter might not make it to the ship waiting offshore. The students' fears wouldn't allow them to sit still any longer. Unable to escape, they barricaded themselves in their room, which supplied little protection. Chopper 2 sustained heavy damage, but managed to make it back to the Independence, loaded with the other half of Dylan's SEAL team. Finally, word came to Captain Williamson from the flight deck that the other chopper had returned as well. Williamson knew Dylan was on the ground, but without radio contact, they had no way of knowing his situation. Canadians continued to advance. The SEALs split into two squads. One squad laid down cover fire as the other moved ahead a few yards. They couldn't remain exposed. Dylan had to get his team in the house. SEALs were fighting for every inch. The remaining 30 yards to the front door of the mansion seemed a world away. Go, 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 go. The Grenadians outnumbered and outgunned the SEALs. slowly fought their way toward the government house. Finally, they achieved their objective. Dylan posted two seals out front of sentries and proceeded inside. They had made it to the house alive with only one casualty. Petty Officer Jack Navarre. Dylan took that as a minor victory, considering that his platoon of only seven men had overcome more than three times that many PRA soldiers.
They weren't sure if Governor General Schoon was wounded, held prisoner, hiding, or dead. Dylan sent his two snipers upstairs, while the remaining three members of the team split up to search downstairs. Despite his leg wound, Navarre still managed to help the team. He was an expert in close quarter assault, and Dylan needed him to secure the premises. The governor had apparently left in a hurry, with no signs of a struggle. But Dylan remained uneasy. Night vision goggles and clear vantage points gave the snipers an edge. Schoon had not turned up in their initial search, but Dylan had to make sure he still wasn't in the house. He wondered why the Grenadians fought so hard to block their entry. How's it looking upstairs? Yeah, all clear upstairs, boss man. We've got tangos on the lawn. Take them out. Already there, sir. The two SEAL snipers were capable of pinpointing a target from 800 yards. Commander, downstairs all clear. Nobody. Nothing. They've got to be here somewhere, gentlemen. Let's find them. search. There was one last place they had not checked. Basement door, first one on the right.
family and staff huddled in the basement with the only weapons they could find. All clear. Clear. You can put down your weapons, sir. You won't be needing any of those. What's happening? As we speak, a deployment of American forces is liberating the island. We're Navy SEALs. We've been sent to rescue you. Yet Dylan had no idea how or when he could evacuate them from the island. We've been having some communication problems with our command post. Our For now, destroyed. they weren't going anywhere. General Austin and his Cuban advisor were desperate. The U.S. response was more than they'd bargained for. With Americans advancing on all sides, the Cuban advisor suggested Austin consolidate his forces in several areas. Because Governor Schoon was a key U.S. ally, controlling him was a major advantage. Austin immediately ordered increased reinforcements to the governor's house. I do. Send it. Boss, we got more visitors. Austin had sent an APC, an armored personnel carrier full of troops. It had armor plating like a tank. Its 30 caliber machine gun had the power to slice through the walls of the government house. But for now, the Grenadians were just waiting. The SEAL team readied itself. How many? They were trained to take out APCs with anti-tank rockets. Is there any activity, anyone coming out of it? But the rocket launcher had left on the second chopper. Fortunately, the Grenadians weren't apprised of this tactical disadvantage and withheld their assault. Dylan confused them further by bluffing with an offensive strike. What's happening? We might have a problem, but uh, nothing we can't handle. Governor, if you and your party would stay down here until I tell you otherwise. Gentlemen. All right, why don't you stay down here with the governor? He'd take care of that leg. Navarre's wound was getting worse. I'm okay, boss. All right. just a matter of time before the Grenadians would attack. Dylan had to come up with a plan that would keep them all alive. Just five miles across town, Lisa, Karen, and Sam remained on edge as the war around them escalated. The guards that had been patrolling outside their building were gone, but they weren't sure what this meant. It wasn't safe to go out. And to stay That's meant more waiting and worrying about what would happen to them. I don't know. The entire Joint Services invasion was supported by the Air Force's AC-130 Spectre gunship, which circled high above the conflict. It could be called into action on a moment's notice. The weapons controllers could unleash its devastating firepower on any land target with pinpoint accuracy. Yet they couldn't fire without clearance from the commander on the ground. And with his long-range radio destroyed, Dylan couldn't order such an attack. Keeping the Grenadians at bay was his only option. I want to tango within 50 yards of this place. But he didn't know how long he could hold out. Admiral Walker was putting together a plan to rescue the SEALs. This is Admiral Walker. I want to know what's happening with my unit. Yet Walker was in a bind. He couldn't fly in additional troops as they might encounter the same resistance. And Dylan still had to make contact. Williamson had a bigger problem. He was desperately trying to find the four missing SEALs who had been parachuted into high seas. He was using every available search team to find them. They had now been in the water over 22 hours, 
And with each minute that went by, the chances of rescuing them grew more remote. The SEALs at Government House were still waiting on the Marine Regiment that had landed on the other side of the island. They were to take the medical school and then reinforce right. the SEALs. Let's analyze the situation. Yet it might be hours before they could get to the SEAL platoon. Dylan would have to make his ammunition hold out as long as possible. He called in a low ammo alert. Copy that, boss man. Dylan still had one advantage. His men were excellent marksmen. And given their vantage point, they could eliminate PRA troops with limited rounds. SEAL units are trained to consider their enemy's tactics. Sooner or later, the PRA would realize the SEALs didn't have the firepower to repulse an assault, and they would attack. But when? They had already been there over an hour, certainly long enough for the PRA troops to regroup. The SEALs braced themselves for the imminent assault. The SEALs were in an entrenched position against the PRA troops, yet their assault rifles would be no match for the APC's 30 caliber machine gun. The schoons were safe behind the walls of the basement, but for how long? Yet strangely, they received help from a most unexpected source. Hello? Just a second. He says he's a priest. Governor? Do you know Monsignor Evans? Hello? Jeffrey. The priest had simply called to check on the governor's safety, Jeffrey, thank you. but had opened a way of escape for them all. Get me JSOC. It was just Sir. the break they needed. Yes, operator. I would like to make an international call to the United States. Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Don't worry, sir. We're gonna get you and your family out of here alive. Petty Officer Hill got the call through. Fort Bragg, how may I direct your call? And directly into the JSOC war plans room. Walker? Sir. With all the sophisticated weaponry and communication systems, it was a simple phone call that saved the day. Glad to finally hear from you. What's your status? Admiral, we have issues here. What do you need? sit by helplessly and listen to the assault. For a moment, the shooting had stopped. I want you to take the Governor General back down to the basement. Sir? Sir? Admiral, we need some air support now. Close air support is on the way. Yes, sir. Give Spectre a heads up. We have two sentries out on the front lawn. When the attack against the house went unanswered, the PRA troops began moving in. That's it. Mansion facing north. 
Sir, we're low on everything here. Is there any ETA and reinforcements? I'm sorry. The Marines were still bogged down trying to reach the medical school. Copy that. Dylan couldn't expect reinforcements until morning. Thank you, sir. The Spectre would be their only backup. coordinates and open fire. The seals outside the government house weren't touched by the gunship's precision fire. Looks like Spectres halted the advance of the APC. through the night. I want to hear short, controlled bursts only. I repeat, short, controlled bursts. Copy that, boss man. Time had run out for the SEALs lost at sea. After a massive search effort, Captain Williamson reported no trace of the missing man. The search was called off. Despite the success of the Spectre assault, Dylan's SEALs couldn't let down their guard. Some PRA soldiers had survived the strafing and remained a threat to the mission. Several SEALs had already run out of ammunition. The others closely guarded what little they had left. Boss man, Junior's out of ammo. had finally defeated the PRA troops controlling the medical school. All right, open up this door. Get this down. Right. Get this dunk out of the way. The students were never so glad to hear a Carolina accent. Okay, okay. Y'all the only people in here? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, all right, all right. Come with me. Sarge, you got some more back here? Commander, we got movement on the perimeter. At Government House, Dylan and his men prepared for a final PRA assault. The SEALs braced themselves for a counter-strike. Are they beginning another attack? But what they feared never materialized. Uh, that's a negative, boss. Man, looks like a pullback. I think they're retreating. Once the Marines took the medical school, they quickly pressed on to Government House. The PRA retreated before the U.S. forces even arrived. Here we go. Governor, this is all that stood between us and hand-to-hand -hand combat. We appreciate all you've done. What's happening now? Our ride is here. The Marines will take care of you from here on out. The SEALs had accomplished their mission. The governor was safe. Overall, the entire American rescue of Granada was a success. Gentlemen. Austin and the other coup leaders were arrested and are presently serving life sentences. The CIA confirmed that the Soviets, East Germans, North Koreans, and Libyans had set up field offices near the new airfield. The island had indeed become a training camp for terrorists. That threat was eliminated. The sacrifice, the courage, the commitment to the lives of these four men. But for Admiral Walker, Lieutenant Commander Dillon and the other SEALs, it was a bittersweet victory. They had lost 14 members in the ocean parachute drop. 
Formation. Attention. The SEALs promised to always recover the bodies of their fallen comrades. But the four SEALs were never found. This intervention in Granada is still celebrated by the island people every year as their day of liberation. But for Dylan and his men, they'll remember it for what it was. <laughs> 